Hi Floss Tube, welcome to Sound Mind Stitching. This is uh, episode 24. It is August 23rd, 2024. Um, I'm Chelsea and this is where I share about cross stitch and sewing, um, mostly cross stitch, but um, I'm back after only a week because in my last video, episode 23, I shared everything I've worked on over the summer. My finishes, my FFOs, my um, new starts, and shared all the things that are my current whips. Um, but I've been able to work on several things this last week, and this isn't going to be a super long video, but I think I'd rather post a short video every single week, if possible. Um, if I have time, then to wait several weeks because then it just kind of feels like a, a mammoth of a task. If you have ever tried to film a floss tube, um, I highly recommend it. It's super fun, but getting everything out, getting everything ironed, um, sorting it, and then putting it all away when you're done, um, it takes some time. So it wasn't too bad this morning because um, I only have a few things to show you and to share. Um, so. A quick life update. I I kind of shared a little bit last time, but a lot of you um, may, might be newer. Um, I had tagged Cross Stitch the Globe in my last video because I mentioned that um, they were also doing Summer in the Village by Al Forest Embroidery, and I'm doing that too. Um, and so they actually talked about me in their video. They mentioned that I had mentioned them, so now there's this back and forth mention. I felt like a, a fangirl. Um, and so I think some of you might have found me from there. Um, and so unless you went back and watched some older videos, um, a quick introduction. I live in Southern Georgia, pretty close to Savannah, but not, not close enough to say that I live in Savannah. Um, we're only about an hour from the beach, which is nice if you like to go to the beach. Um, and I have four kids and I'm married. My husband um, is a pastor of a church. Um, we moved here in March 2020 from South Carolina. So we've lived here about four and a half years and we have four kids. Um, our oldest is in ninth grade and just started high school at a local kind of like a magnet school, um, a public magnet school in our district. Our second son is 13. He's in eighth grade. He is finishing up middle school. Both of them are doing marching band um, for the first time this year. Our eighth grader got invited to join. Um, he plays percussion and my our older son plays the sousaphone. Um, so we're getting ready for our first season of marching band. Um, we also have a daughter who is seven and she is just starting second grade at our local elementary school. And um, our youngest, who is four and a half. So if you're doing your math, yes, he was born 10 days before we moved to Georgia, um, right on the day that COVID was declared a global pandemic. That was his birthday. Um, so he is four and a half and our um, Georgia has a public, uh, I think it's funded by the lottery, uh, pre-K program um, and it is free. So he started that this year. So this is the first year that all my kids have been in school all day. Our four-year-old, the last few years, was in just a little like morning preschool a few days a week. Um, but I work part-time from home, and so um, when he was in preschool just a few hours a week, I had to work the whole time he was there. That was my working time, and so I never really had time when I was just home without kids where I wasn't working. So this is now the end of week two of school, and it's been a journey, not bad, just been it's been weird honestly um, I'm just so used to having somebody here <laughs> so um, my husband's here some he uh, we live in a rural area our church is not huge and so his schedule is very flexible and he often works from home or if he has to work in the evening he'll be home in the morning so he's here but he's not asking me to like make him lunch or you know whatever so he's not a problem um, Anyway, I do work part-time for a website called Southern Savers. Um, it is, I'm just a contractor, but um, it's a frugal living couponing deal website. So I um, write content for the frugal living portion of the website. Frugality is, I think I was born with it, um, but being in uh, 
my husband's line of work. We've we've been he's been on staff at a, a church or in a ministry ever since we were married, which um, actually even I guess yeah after we were married the year we got married he was first on staff at a church and we've been married 15 and a half years so we feel very called to this life but it is not um, it's not the most lucrative profession although it's we're paid he's paid very generously um, so anyway frugality has always been. Uh, a big part of our life and I do it without even trying <laughs> I, I'm not like forcing myself to do it I can't I, I, I struggle to not be frugal and um, anyway so that's just a little bit about me um, so other things that I enjoy are reading and I am gonna share some books in this video at the end because I don't have a ton of cross stitch content um, I had a great conversation at midsummer stitch with other cross stitchers who love to read so I thought toward the end I'm gonna share my five top reads of the summer. Um, some are older books, some are new, um, and almost all of them, I think all of them were audiobooks that I listened to while I was stitching. Oh, one was a book. Um, one was a, a print book, but four of them were audiobooks that I listened to and I usually stitch when I'm listening if I can. So if you like to read, stick around to the end. If you don't like to read, you can leave before the books. Um, I do have a little bit of haul and I, again, because I'm, <laughs> because I'm kind of frugal, and we don't have a huge budget for me to just buy cross stitch stuff. Um, I don't have usually have a lot of haul. Um, I only spend it. I only spend my like blow money when I'm really, really wanting something, or I've been waiting for it. I've been planning for it. So um, one thing I have been waiting for that I mentioned last video because I showed you some of my other. Um, finishes in the series is Lindy Stitch's airmail series. Um, she has come out with nine charts so far out of 12. There's one for going to be one for each month. So the most recent one just came out for, well, it was kind of a, a needlework market release, but I already got it. I guess she already had them printed. So um, I think it was kind of for needlework market, but this is um, October, the Japanese Bantam. Um, I was really looking forward to October because I was hoping it would be you know, I figured it would have some kind of fall Halloween type colors. And I love that this is like Halloween-ish, but it's not Halloween, you know? Um, just the colors are amazing. Um, this is uh, a mix of Weeks Dye Work and DMC. Um, it's got six Weeks Dye Work, and I did Weeks Dye Works, and I did order the floss pack with it. Um, but well I'll show you in a minute I put all the floss for all the ones I have left on one ring so I can't show you just the floss for this but this black is um Weeks Dye Works Kohl K-O-H-L not C-O-A-L um and I just love it I cannot wait to do this one um I am excited so that was one of my I was planning so I was planning to buy this I was gonna wait I thought I might wait till September because I already have stuff to stitch, but then I was on the notify me list on Lindy Stitch's website for this pattern book, and it happened to I happened to get an email saying it was available like right after the rooster came out, and I wasn't gonna wait, so I just went for it. So I got Twin Peak Primitives Quirky Quitters 2024. Um, when I I think it was the dog. You see there on the side when I saw this. I I'm not I'm not like a huge primitive like I don't know this isn't usually my vibe um, but this dog I think it kind of reminded me of our dog he is a blue tick coon hound and he's kind of darkish colored and his face kind of reminded me of our dog who actually really gets on my nerves but I do kind of love him anyway and the checkerboard my husband's a big Tennessee fan and so the checkerboard football like the college the football I don't know something about that dog drew me in and I just wanted this so badly so when I saw it was available I got this I got the floss pack and the rooster and then I got some fabric for these um, which I will show you because I did start one I'll show you that in a minute but um, there's seven patterns um, I don't know if I'm gonna do all of them but um, I really really like it and I have never um, ordered from Twin Peak Primitives but the patterns are really big they are black and white um, but they, these are not big charts. Like I think the biggest one is 85 by 85 ish. Um, 
but the charts take up like an entire page. So they're really big, really easy to read. And the back stitching, um, we can see on every chart, there's kind of these like little swirlies and there's some back stitching on the animals. Um, the back stitching is huge. It's so easy to see like where you're supposed to do it. Sometimes I find charts, it's really hard to read the back stitching. So um, anyway, that was my haul. Um, I do have one finish. Um, I showed part of this, I was still working on this last week, but I decided something about doing a floss tube makes you wanna like finish things so that people can see them. <laughs> um, but this is uh, Helping in the Coneflowers by, you guessed it, Lindy Stitches. Um, I made this for my sister. She has a dog, his name is Bart. You can see his name that I backstitched in there. Um, he looks just like this dog. Um, I did make some changes. I, I chopped off the tail because her dog doesn't have a tail. And I changed the ears to be the same color as the rest of the dog because the original, the ears were a bit darker. Um, this was really pretty quick. Um, it does have some over dyed. I did kind of a, a little bit of a conversion. I had some of the colors, but not all. Um, I found the field, like the lines of the field, to be very fun to stitch. It was just straight up diagonals, and that was like very satisfying to put those in. Um, so yeah, that was my, my one finish this last week. I really also love these cone flowers. Um, the, it, the color's not showing up super great, but um, this is um, 32 count silver moon linen. Let me confirm that that's right. Yeah, this is the same fabric I'm using for all the airmail. This was an extra piece. Um, so it fit perfectly. This is like a four by six, like the pattern uh, has stitched. So today I'm going out to the craft store and I think I'm going to try to look for a frame, like a five by seven frame um, that will complement this. The the model, it's kind of like a greenish frame, kind of pulling out the wheelbarrow. And so I want to see if I can find something like that. My sister is pretty um, quirky and funky, so she won't mind. She'll enjoy, I think, a weird, like an, or just a different color frame. Um, I also had two new starts. And um, one, let me find it, is, oh, here it is, um, is the dog from the Quirky Quitter quirky critters book um this is what i have so far so i've got part of the blanket thing on his back and the legs um this is 36 count vintage vintage country mocha linen which is uh the called for was either 16 or 32 count but i got 36 count because i wanted them to be a little bit smaller i had never stitched on vintage country mocha i know it's like the a staple of for many stitchers but I wasn't ever sure about the color. I don't, I don't know. It looked like a brown that I didn't love, um, but I really like this fabric. I love the feel of it. Um, and I like that, you know, one side is kind of the more modeled and the other side is not. Um, I mean, not that I'm gonna show you that, but if you wanted to do not modeled, you could. And um, I just like the feel of it. You know, everybody has a feel that they like and I really like like the way that this feels. So I also went ahead, I got a whole, I had to get a fat quarter because that was the smallest option. So I measured and basically cut out, I was able to cut out six pieces of fabric and I just used my sewing machine to kind of finish off the edges so they don't fray. Um, again, there are seven patterns, but I don't know that I'll do all of them. And I determined that I'd be able to put these in like a six inch hoop. Um, and so I might do like a wall of, of the hoops. I don't know the, you know, the, the pattern they finish them kind of into like ornaments but I don't I don't know that I'm gonna do that I have some other hoops in my stitching area and I think I like I think I'm gonna put them in hoops so that was my first start I did want to show you just how um, more vibrant I feel like the colors were in real life than they were I know they always say you know the the real thing looks better but like there's the dog and like this is just so much brighter and I'm really happy with how bright it is. Um, I really, really like how it looks. Um, so that was one start. My other start is uh, the September Airmail by Lindy Stitches. So I actually bought this a while ago. Um, 
but here's the chart. So this is the rainbow bearded thornbill. Um, it's kind of, again, some good fall colors there, the browns and greens and oranges. Um, this came out last year, I think, like last September. Um, so I got a start on this. This is also 32 count silver moon linen. I, I love the way this linen feels also. I've used the 32 and the 36 and um, I'm not a very like use really crazy colored uh, fabric. I, I love to branch out, but for like basic things, I really like this. It's just kind of a grayish, light gray neutral. Um, it looks like almost shimmery in this light, but um, I've done a lot of pieces um, on this fabric. So I love, she does this like almost like geode thing on the wings for all of these. So I'm kind of working on getting all that filled in. Um, I hope to finish this in the next week or so and then get excited about working on that rooster. So I wanted to show you um, all together the fall ones if you're not familiar with all of the airmail series but these are the fall um, patterns. So it's September, October, and then November is this turkey. Um, I'm excited about that. I love the teal on that one. And I plan to do that one after I finish these two. So I'm super excited about these. I just think they're so, these are like of the seasons, I think the fall ones are probably my favorite. I just really love, um, love how those look. Okay. So other than that, I only have one whip, which you saw last week because I started this um, earlier this summer, but I've pretty much, other than starting those two, those two and finishing the cone flowers, I've just been working on the raccoon. I put it on a board, so again, if you can hold that better. So if you're new, I did this back in the spring. Um, these are by Cottage Garden Samplings. This is the jackrabbit, this is the raccoon, and then this, some of the fabric is folded, but the ferret will go over here. Um, I made some good progress. I, I, maybe I'm halfway done. Um, it's hard to tell because like the raccoon itself is extremely dense, but then the flowers around it are not. So I feel like I'm about halfway done probably. Um, but I've done a lot of the like, those little kind of bluish diamond shapes on the body. I did those first because it only required counting over like one stitch to do them and now that I have them all in um, it's very easy to stay on track with the rest of the stitching because I can just count off of you know any one of those um, I'm basically working on trying to just get a lot of fill in left so um, the house is done uh, these flowers on this side are mostly done the tail is done um, and yeah I'm, I'm trying to decide I, I had said I think in my last video that I would um, work on the ferret next, but I was looking at it last night at the chart, and I think that I might um, save it for the spring. It, it's a very spring pattern, because it is the um, three spring charts. Um, so I think I might save it and work on all this other fall stuff. Um, oh, I forgot to show you all the thread, sorry. So this is, is this all of it? I think this is pretty much, oh no, there's two different, I was like, this isn't very much. This is all of the called for thread <laughs> for all the quirky quir quirky critters. Um, it's all DMC. Uh, why did I feel like I needed to pull all these out? I don't know, but I really love kidding up a project and this was really fun. So, um, you know, it'll be a chore to put them back, but I don't care. I like, I like having it all here. So that was the um, quirky critters quirky critters that I cannot say that today um, this floss is all for airmail so all of the three that for the fall um, so there is some overdyed on here and um, then the rest is DMC there's like a knot in the end I I don't know if I've ever shown this if I have it's been a long time but I have not seen a lot of people that use their floss this way. Um, a friend of mine, Sarah, who stitches, uh, had this idea a couple years ago, and I've slowly been converting all of my floss. Um, I've always had them on bobbins. I'm definitely a bobbinator, 
um, but I used to keep them on bobbins in my box and then I would make my own little floss drops out of old uh, gift tags and then um, my friend Sarah discovered a hole punch that could actually punch holes in the bobbins so now all of my bobbins are also floss drops um, and so all you have to do is okay sorry my phone was full I don't know how that happened but um, I had to delete some things so I can finish I don't, I don't have a lot more to share but um, I wasn't quite done yet because I still had not talked about books anyway I was showing you my floss drop bobbins um, so now whenever I pull a new color um, like a new floss color and I unravel it and I hadn't already punched it I just punch a hole and I put the floss on it back on it um, a lot of the quirky critters it was it was interesting um, I don't know that I would have realized this otherwise but the DMC as I was pulling it she uses so many DMC colors that I like I guess never use or haven't used in several years because I've I started converting mine to drops um, maybe two years ago and so some of these colors in there I had never unraveled in two years so that was kind of fun um, and now who knows how close I am to all of my floss being that way but new floss I always put on it and I do put my over dyed um, I don't know if I have uh, I don't know I don't think I have any um, to show you but I, I do take my over dyed off of the other ones and put them on a, a floss on a bobbin with a hole um, once I've once I've used them so anyway those are my uh, threads um, my plans for this next week um, I shared long-term plans last video but my plans for the next week are um, probably just to work on finishing all three of those um, I the raccoon I consider a, a bigger piece it is really dense and also um, it just feels like kind of cumbersome so I don't take that one with me when I go somewhere unless I know I'm gonna be there for a long time um, it's not quick to put away <laughs> so I do take it to my daughter's cheerleading practice because that is a long time um, but I love the the little dog and the airmail because those are so um, quick I just make like a working copy of the pattern and I just can stick it in my project bag so those are kind of my travel pieces or if I'm just too tired to do a more complicated pattern um, I did want to show you some sewing I didn't even think to share this last time because I had so many projects to share but over the summer I did do some sewing and I made three project bags um, I've made project bags before from um, an Elizabeth Ann can stitch pattern um, and I liked them they're all cloth and it was a great tutorial um, her it was very easy to follow um, any error in my bags was user error and not her fault because I was new to my sewing machine but over time they have fallen apart well this actually this is this is where I'm keeping the quirky critters um, this is one of them but this one's not terrible but you can see like I didn't really know what I was doing here on the side so this I didn't really understand uh, the um, what do you even call them seam seam allowance seam margin seam allowances I didn't really understand those and so some of them are kind of coming apart at the seams um, but I've learned a lot about sewing since then and I found another video at the beginning of the summer and I can't for the life of me remember what it was who it was called but I know I saved it so I'll put it in the description box um, but she showed a really at least it looked easy tutorial for vinyl front project bags um, and so I made three of these this summer when my kids were all out of town. Um, I actually see now that I'm, I made a, have a little issue at the top of this one, but you're gonna get the idea. So the way that you do these is you pick um, two colors and you could do more than that. But basically you pick a color for the background and then you pick another color and you cut fabric to go around the zipper. Um, so that's like two different pieces and then you just cut a large piece of for the back so this um, in you sorry I'm like trying to explain it you basically you use fusible um, like a, a bat a batting to kind of give it a little bit of um, thickness and you sew the 
inside fabric to the back and then you put together the zipper part and then you just fold you the seam allowances or the the borders on the back piece are really really wide so you basically fold them over to make the binding as you can see uh, not great sewing work here but um, you don't have to make like a separate binding so you can see on the back you just sew along the edge and again I'm not and I'm not I'm still learning how to sew um, but and then this is vinyl so you can see what's on the inside this is my summer in the village pattern um, so yeah that that was I was really happy so I can't remember which one I made first but I made three um, I'm gonna try to not show you the pattern necessarily but um, this is the another one I made um, it has this really cute sorry, this is a very full bag mermaid print that I think I got at Walmart um, this is a, a kitted up project that I haven't started and then I think this one might be my favorite um, this is where I'm keeping summer in the village so I'm gonna have to pull it out because I made a working copy of all of the pages <laughs> so that I wouldn't have to um, I didn't want to mess up my book so um, this one I think is my favorite look at this bird fabric I found this in like a remnants bin and I did have to sew two pieces of it together to make it big enough um, but then the back is this kind of reddish orange grunge and this one I think was the third one I did so I actually did a pretty good job on the sewing because I had figured out by then how to do it <laughs> um, but yeah I love this one and this is just vinyl which I got at Hobby Lobby I I didn't know how much vinyl cost it is very cheap I think I got a whole yard or I've gotten multiple yards and I could make like 12 more project bags with the amount of vinyl that I got um, so anyway that was my sewing I've got more sewing plans for the fall but that is what I've done so far um, that is all of my stitching and all of my sewing. Uh, the last thing I wanted to share was my five favorite books from the summer. So I'm gonna try to throw the um, covers up next to me. Um, I love audiobooks. Um, I do have more time now to actually read physical books, but in the summer especially, it was all audiobooks, except for when I went on vacation by myself without kids. <laughs> um, so one of my favorite books of the summer was A Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Tolls. This is an older book. It's been around for 10 years, maybe eight years. Um, other people I know have read it. They said, you should read it. You'll love it. And I don't know. I just never did. So I finally got around to reading it this year and I did love it. So thank you to everyone who said I would. I did. Um, I really, really love Russian history and this book is set at the beginning it starts during the Russian Revolution in 1917 and it's essentially about a man who is kind of a um, arist arist aristocrat um, let's say aristocat nope that's a Disney movie aristocrat who if you know anything about Russian history they were the ones who the Bolsheviks were overthrowing so you know that is when they um, killed the czar and his family they did not want the rich people around but because of something that happened in the past the new government allowed this man um, to just live in a hotel but he's basically under house arrest in this hotel and maybe I knew the premise and maybe that's what kept me from reading it because I thought how interesting could a book about a man who lives in a hotel be <laughs> did not seem like it would be that good but I was wrong um, the writing is amazing the character development is amazing I cried um, it's a fantastic book I loved it um, another book that is newer is Stephen King's new book of short stories slash novellas it's called you tell it darker um, man I love Stephen King um, his short story collections are some of his best work if you've never read him I highly recommend starting there um, if you are a Stephen King fan, um, you will enjoy the fact that um, there's flashbacks to, you know, his other stories. Um, the most surprising part of this book, I did not see it coming, was he um, does a retelling of a very, very famous short story by um, 
Flannery O'Connor. And I just finished reading her like complete works, um, which was a journey, <laughs> not a journey that I really enjoyed, but I was really wanted to, to understand um, kind of the appeal that many people um, see in her. And anyway, so one of these stories in the book starts and I'm listening to it. And I'm like, man, this, this feels kind of familiar. I mentioned it to my husband and he's like, huh, that's weird, but I hadn't finished it yet. And at the end, he confirms that it, he, he wrote it kind of in honor of her. So he, he did write it based on this. And honestly, I think I like his version a lot better, to be honest. Um, so yeah, that was a great, a great read. Um, another read, if you're not into super intense stuff was, uh, True North by Andrew Graff. This was my second book by him. His first book was called Raft of Stars. I read it a couple years ago. He really likes books about rafting. I don't know his background, but both of his books are about like rafting, canoeing, and kayaking. <laughs> or, you know, th those are like a huge plot point in the books. I don't know anything about that, but this was a great book. Um, it was intense in that it's about a marriage that is kind of on the brink and two different, the husband and wife, kind of their journey of recognizing their own the, the parts they have both played in the kind of deterioration of their marriage is just very real. Like if you have ever been in a difficult relationship, whether it's marriage or something else, um, it's extremely relatable. It's, it's just, it's really, really, really well done. Again, even if you don't like, like rafting, don't worry about that. Um, another one that I just actually, I read it earlier this summer, but I just finished my second book by the same author. It's called Nuclear War by Annie Jacobson. As you can tell, I really like intense books. <laughs> this book is, I don't know what trigger warnings I shouldn't give because it probably, you know, death, destruction, uh, people, what, what, what happens when a nuclear bomb hits is essentially saying, pretending like, okay, uh, another country has attacked the U.S. Um, with a nuclear bomb, what would happen next? Based on, like, the protocols the government has for that, based on what other nations would do, how it would affect people, the environment, society, the world. Anyway, it goes through the whole thing. Um, if you like, you know, exploration of, like, politics, or not politics, but, like, how the government works and um, that kind of stuff, you would really love this. I just, I just love like worst case scenario books. So I loved this and I just finished this morning actually another book by her about um, the history of the CIA, which was fascinating. So she's one of my new uh, favorite authors. Her, her writing is, is just fascinating. The fifth book I wanted to talk about was another, um, not my favorite read, but uh, a good read. Um, I did read this as a physical book. It's The Good Sister by Sally Hepworth. I'd never read any of her books and she's kind of, among other people I, I know, a lot of people like her books. Um, they're kind of like just regular fiction, but they usually, like psychological thriller, I guess would be the category. So I grabbed this at the library because it was the only book they had by her. And I took it with me to the beach with my mom and I read it all in one sitting, one day at the beach with no interruption. It was glorious. Um, and it was, it was a fast read. It was, uh, it was good. Um, I don't want to say anything about it because you really kind of have to experience it, but, um, that was, that was a, a good read of the summer. So those are my five top books, um, of the summer. And I hope to keep sharing more books. Um, I finish a couple books a week, so I don't know that I would like share everything I'm reading like I would what I'm stitching, but um, I hope to share some highlights. And as I was posting my video last week, I noticed on like my list of all my videos that my video a couple years ago where I shared 10 long audiobooks that I really enjoyed listening to while stitching, it's one of my most viewed videos and I've listened to a lot more long audiobooks since then. So I may make another version of that um, since that's something that at least the readers among you seem to enjoy. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you for watching. Um, I hope to be back next week or the next week, um, depending on how much stitching I get done. And um, yeah, I hope you have a great weekend and I look forward to interacting with you. Um, 
I feel free to leave questions or, you know, uh, these charts are pretty self-explanatory, but um, there are only a few. So if you have any questions or something I didn't make clear, I'll respond. Um, but yeah, happy stitching and I'll talk to you soon.